Section 19 of the Gospel in Brief by Leo Tolstoy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. A Recapitulation, Chapters 9 through 12. Chapter 9 Temptations. The illusions of temporal life conceal from men the true life in the present. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Man is born with the knowledge of the true life of fulfillment of the Father's will. Children live by that knowledge. Through them we may see what the Father's will is. To understand the teaching of Jesus, one must understand the life of children and be like them. Children always live in the Father's will, not breaking the five commandments. They would not come to break them if their elders did not mislead them. In misleading children to break these commandments, men ruin the children. In misleading them, men are doing as they would do by fastening a millstone to a man's neck and throwing him into the water. If there were no temptations, the world would be happy. The world is unhappy by them only. These temptations are wrongdoing which men enact for imaginary gain to the life in time. Temptations ruin men, therefore it is necessary to give up everything rather than fall into temptation. Temptations against the first commandment leads men to consider themselves in the right against others and others as in the wrong, debtors to them. To avoid this temptation, men must remember that all men are infinitely in debt to the Father, and they can only clear themselves of this debt by forgiving their brother men. Therefore, men must overlook injuries, and not be deterred, though the offender again and again injure them. However many times a man may be injured, he must forgive, and still forgive, not remembering the wrong. For the kingdom of heaven is forgiveness. If we do not forgive, we are doing as the debtor did. This debtor, greatly owing, came to him in whose power he was and began to ask for mercy. The other forgave him all. The debtor went away and began himself to squeeze a debtor who owed him but a little. Now to gain life we must fulfill the Father's will, and we pray the Father to forgive us that we have not duly fulfilled his will and we hope to be forgiven. What then are we doing if we do not ourselves forgive? We are doing to others what we dread for ourselves. The will of the Father is well-being, and evil is that which separates us from the Father. Why then should we not strive to quench evil right away, when evil ruins us and takes our life? Temptation against the second commandment is to think that woman is created for the bodily pleasure, and that in leaving one woman and taking another, heightened pleasure is gained. To avoid this temptation, we must remember that the Father's will is not that man should amuse himself with women's charms, but that every man with his wife should be one body. The Father's will is, for every man one wife, for every wife one husband. If man keep to one wife, then there is wife or husband for each one who needs. Therefore he who changes the woman he lives with deprives her of a husband, and tempts some other man to leave his wife and take the deserted one. A man may do without a wife, but he must not have more than one, because if he does, he goes against the will of the Father, which is, that one man unite with one woman. Temptation against the third commandment is for men to create, for the protection of the temporal life, authoritative powers, and to demand from each other oaths, pledges, to do the deeds those powers demand. To avoid this temptation, men must remember that they are not indebted for their life to any power but God. The claims of authority must be regarded as violence, and following the commandment regarding the non-resistance of evil, men must yield what the authorities demand, namely, their goods and labor, but they cannot, either by oaths or promises, pledge their conduct. Oaths being imposed make men bad. He who recognizes life in the will of the Father cannot bind his actions by pledges, because for such a man there is nothing more sacred than his own life. Temptation against the fourth commandment is for men to hold that, by giving themselves up to animosity and revenge, they can exterminate evil from among themselves. If a man injure another, men think he should be punished, and that justice lies in human judgment. To be free from this temptation, we must remember that men are called, not to judge, but to save each other. To judge of another's injustice is impossible for men, as they themselves are full of wickedness. The only thing open to them is to teach others by example of goodness, forgiveness, and purity. Temptation against the fifth commandment is for man to think there is a difference between one's own countrymen and men of other nations, and that it is therefore necessary to make defense against other nations and to injure them. To avoid this temptation, it is necessary to know that all the commandments are summed up in this one, of fulfilling the will of the Father, who gives life and well-being to all men, and therefore it is necessary to do good to all men without distinction. Even though others still make such distinctions, and though nations who look on each other as aliens are at war, nevertheless, everybody who would fulfill the Father's will must do good to all men, even to those who belong to another nation which is at war. 
to avoid falling into any delusions of men we must not think about bodily affairs but about spiritual to him who has understood that life consists in being at this moment in the father's will neither deprivations nor suffering nor death can be dreadful only he obtains true life who is at every moment ready to give up his bodily life in order to fulfill the father's will and that all may understand the true life to be one in which there is no death jesus said eternal life must not be understood to be like this present life for the true life in the father's will there is neither space nor time those who are awakened to the true life live in the will of the father for which there is no space or time and they live with the father though they die to us they live to god therefore one commandment includes in itself all others the commandment namely to love with all our strength the source of life and consequently to love all men of each each of whom bears in himself this same original the source of this life is that very christ which you await the comprehension of this source of life which knows no distinction of persons no time no place is the son of man which i teach anything which hides this source of life from men is temptation there is the temptation of the scribes bookmen and of the materialists do not yield thereto there are the temptations of authority do not yield thereto and there is the most terrible temptation from the teachers of religion who call themselves orthodox beware of this last more than of all the others because just they these self-ordained teachers by inventing the worship of a false god decoy you from the true god they instead of serving the father of life by deeds substitute words and they teach words while they themselves do nothing therefore you can learn nothing from them but words but the father requires deeds not words and they have nothing to teach because they themselves know nothing but for their own gain they must parade as teachers but you know that no man can be the teacher of another there is one teacher for all the lord of life understanding and these self-assuming teachers thinking to teach others deprive themselves of true life and prevent others from the understanding of it they teach that their god will be pleased with external ceremonies and they think they can bring men to serve religion by vows they are concerned with appearances only an outward assumption of religion suffices them but they do not care what is in the hearts of men therefore they are all like elaborate coffins very nice outside but within full of repulsiveness they give honor in words to saints and martyrs but they are themselves just the very men who have murdered and tortured in the past and who murder and torture the saints of today by them come all of the world's temptations because under the guise of good they teach evil the temptation they create is the root of all others because they defile that which is most sacred for a long time yet they will not be changed but will continue their deceptions and increase evil in the world but there shall come a time when all the temples will be ruined with all the external god worship when all men will understand and unite in love to serve the one father of life by fulfilling his will chapter 10 the warfare with temptation therefore not to fall by temptation we must at every moment of life be at one with the father lead us not into temptation the jews saw that the teaching of jesus would destroy their state religion and nationality and at the same time they saw they could not controvert him so they decided to kill him his innocence and justness stood in their way but the high priest caiaphas discovered a reason for killing jesus though innocent caiaphas said we need not consider whether this man is just or unjust we have to determine whether our jewish people shall remain a separate nation or whether we shall be broken up and dispersed the nation will perish and the people will be scattered if we leave this man alone and do not put him to death this argument settled the matter and the orthodox sentenced jesus to death they instructed the people to seize upon him as soon as he might appear in jerusalem jesus although he knew about this nevertheless on the feast of the passover came to jerusalem his disciples entreated him not to do so but he said what these orthodox can do to me and all that other man can do cannot alter the truth for me if i have the light i know where i am and which way i am going only he who does not know the truth can fear anything or can doubt anything only he who cannot see stumbles and he went to jerusalem stopping on the way at bethany when he left bethany and went to jerusalem crowds of people met and followed him this still more convinced the orthodox of the need to kill him they only wanted an opportunity to seize him he knew also that the lightest incautious word from him at that time spoken against the law would be a reason for his execution but notwithstanding this he entered the temple and declared again that the worship of the jews with their sacrifices and libations was false and he declared his teaching but his teaching based on the prophets was such that the orthodox could not yet find a palpable breach of the law which would justify them in putting him to death 
the more so that the greater part of the lower class was with Jesus. At the feast were certain heathen, who, having heard of the teaching of Jesus, wished to talk with him about it. The disciples, hearing of this, were afraid, fearing lest Jesus, in talking with them, should betray himself and excite the people. At first they would not bring Jesus and these heathen together, but afterwards they resolved to tell him these men wanted to see him. Hearing this, Jesus was disturbed. He well knew that his speech to the heathen would clearly show his antagonism to the whole Jewish law, and would turn the crowd from him, and would give the Orthodox a reason to accuse him of being in league with the hated heathen. Jesus became disturbed, knowing this. But he also knew that his mission was to make clear to men, the children of one father, their real unity, despite differences of religion. He knew that the step he was about to take would end his bodily life for the sake of giving birth to spiritual results. He said, He who holds fast to the bodily life is deprived of the true one, and he who is not careful for the bodily life obtains the true life. I am troubled by what is before me, but I have only lived that I might reach this hour. How then can I fail now to do what I must do? So let the Father's will be shown through me now. And turning to the people, heathen and Jews, Jesus declared openly what he had only privately told Nicodemus. He said, Men's lives, with all their various religions and organized powers, must be wholly changed. All power and authority must disappear. It is only necessary to understand the nature of man as the son of the father of life. And this understanding abolishes all division among men, and all ruling power, and makes men one. The Jews said, You wholly destroy our religion. Our law looks to the Christ, but you speak only of the Son of Man, and say that he must be set up. What do you mean? He answered them, To set up the Son of Man means to live by the light of the understanding which is in men, to follow this light into more light. I teach no new faith, only that which every one may know within himself. Every man knows he has life given to him and to all men by the Father of life. My teaching is only this, that man must live the life given by the Father to all. Many of the humbler kind of people believed Jesus, but the notable and official classes disbelieved, because they did not want to consider the universal basis of what he said, but only its immediate and temporary bearings. They saw that he turned the people from themselves, and they wished to kill him, but they were afraid to seize him openly, and did not seek to do so in Jerusalem and in the daytime, but secretly elsewhere. And one of the twelve disciples, Judas Iscariot, approached the authorities, and him they bribed to take their emissaries to Jesus when he should be away from the people. Judas promised this, and went again to Jesus, awaiting a suitable opportunity to betray him. On the first day of the feast, Jesus and his disciples kept the Passover. And Judas, thinking Jesus was not aware of his treachery, was with them. But Jesus knew Judas had sold him. And as they all sat at the table, Jesus took the bread, broke it in twelve pieces, and gave a piece to each disciple, including Judas, with the rest. And not mentioning any name, he said, Take, eat my body. Then he took the cup with the wine, passed it to them for them all, including Judas, to drink from, and said, One of you will shed my blood. Drink my blood. Afterwards, Jesus got up and began to wash the feet of all his disciples, including Judas. And having finished, he said, I know that one of you will betray me to my death and shed my blood, but him I have fed and given drink, and I washed his feet. I have done this to show you how you must act towards those who do you harm. If you will act in this way, you shall be blessed. And the disciples went on to ask who the betrayer was, but Jesus did not give his name, so that they might not turn on him. And when it had grown dark, Jesus showed that it was Judas, and at the same time told him to go away. Judas got up from the table and went off, no one hindering him. Then Jesus said, This is the meaning of setting up the Son of Man. To set up the Son of Man is to be like the Father, good, and that not only those who love us, but to all men, even to those who do us harm. And therefore do not argue over my teaching, do not pick it to pieces as the Orthodox did, but do as I have done, do as I have done under your eyes. This one commandment I give you, love men. My whole teaching is to love men always and to the last. After this, fear came over Jesus, and he went in the dark with his disciples to a garden to be out of the way. While walking, he said to them, You are all wavering and timid. If they move to take me, you will all run away. To this Peter said, No, I will never leave you. I will defend you even to death. And all the disciples said so. Then Jesus said, If that be the case, then get ready for defense. Take provision, because we must hide. Take weapons to fight for ourselves. The disciples said they had two swords. When Jesus heard this about the swords, anguish came over him, and going to a vacant place he began to pray and entreated his disciples to do the same. But the disciples did not understand his state of mind. 
jesus said my father the spirit end me in the struggle with temptation strengthen me to the fulfillment of thy will i do not want my own way i do not want to defend my bodily life i want to do thy will in not resisting evil the disciples still did not understand and he said to them do not consider the concerns of the body but try to rise into the spirit strength is in the spirit but the flesh is powerless and a second time he said my father if suffering must be then let it come but even in suffering i want one thing only that not my will shall be fulfilled but thine the disciples did not understand and again he struggled with the temptation and at last conquered it coming to the disciples he said it is settled now you can be at rest i shall not fight but shall surrender myself into the hands of the men of this world chapter eleven the farewell discourse the self-life is an illusion which comes through the flesh and evil the true life is the life common to all men deliver us from evil jesus finding himself prepared for death went to give himself up peter stopped him and asked where are you going jesus answered i am going where you cannot go i am ready for death and you are not yet ready peter said no i am even now ready to sacrifice my life for thee jesus said to him a man cannot promise anything and he said to all his disciples i know death is before me but i believe in the life of the father and therefore am not afraid of it do not be distressed over my death but believe in the real god in the father of life and then my death will not seem dreadful to you if i am united with the father of life then i cannot be deprived of life it is true i do not tell you what and where my life will be after death but i point out to you the way to true life my teaching does not reveal what that life is to be but it reveals the only true way of life that is to be in unity with the father the father is the source of life my teaching is that men shall live in the will of the father and fulfill his will for the life and well-being of all men your teacher when i am gone will be your knowledge of the truth in fulfilling my teaching you will always feel that you are in the truth that the father is in you and you are in the father and knowing in yourselves the father of life you will experience a peace of which nothing will deprive you and therefore if you know the truth and live in it neither my death nor your own can trouble you men think of themselves as separate beings each with his own power of will in life but this is only an illusion the only true life is that which recognizes the father's will as the source of life my teaching reveals this oneness of life and represents life not as separate shoots but as one tree on which all the shoots grow only he who lives in the father's will like a shoot of a tree only he lives and he who wishes to live by his own will dies away like a torn off shoot the father gave me life to do good and i have taught you to live to do good if you will fulfill my commandment you will be blessed the commandment which sums up my whole teaching is no more than this that all men shall love one another and love is to sacrifice one's own bodily life for another's sake love has no other definition in fulfilling my commandment of love you will not fulfill it like slaves who follow the orders of a master without understanding them but you will live as free men as i am because i have made clear to you the purpose of life which follows from the knowledge of the father of life you have adopted my teaching not from accidental choice but because it is the only truth by which men are made free the teaching of the world is to do evil to men but i teach that men love each other therefore the world would despise you as it has despised me the world does not understand my teaching and therefore will persecute you and do you evil thinking thereby to serve god do not be astonished at this you must understand that it is necessarily so the world not understanding the true god must persecute you but you must affirm the truth you grieve because they will kill me but they kill me for declaring the truth and therefore my death is necessary for the declaration of the truth my death in facing which i do not go back from the truth will strengthen you and you will understand the nature of untruth and of truth you will understand that untruth lies in men's belief in the bodily life and their disbelief in the life of the spirit that truth consists in unity with the father from which results the victory of the spirit over the flesh even when i shall not be with you in the bodily life my spirit will be with you but you like all men will not always feel within you the power of the spirit sometimes you will relax and lose strength of spirit and you will fall into temptation and at times you will again awaken to the true life hours of bondage to the body will come upon you but for a time only you will suffer and again be restored to the spirit like a woman who suffers birth pangs and then has joy because she has brought a human being into the world so will your experience be when after falling under the power of the body you rise again by the spirit you will then feel such joy that nothing will be left for you to desire know this then beforehand 
and in spite of persecution in spite of internal struggle and casting down of spirit know that the spirit lives in you and that the only true god is the knowledge of the father's will as i have revealed it and addressing the father the spirit jesus said i have done that which thou hast commanded me i have revealed to men that thou art the source of everything and they have understood me i have taught them that they all come from the source of infinite life and therefore they are all one and that as the father is in me and i am in the father so they too are one with me and the father i have revealed to them also that like thee who in love has sent them into the world they too shall with love live in the world chapter 12 the victory of the spirit over the flesh therefore for him who lives not the self life but a common life in the will of the father there is no death bodily death is for him union with the father thine is the kingdom power and glory when jesus had ended his discourse to the disciples he rose and instead of running away or defending himself he went on the way to meet judas who was bringing soldiers to take him jesus came to judas and asked him why he had come but judas did not answer and a crowd of soldiers came round jesus peter threw himself forward to defend his teacher and drawing his sword began to fight but jesus stopped him and said to him that he who fights with a sword must himself perish with the sword and ordered him to put up the sword then jesus said to those who had come to take him i have up to now gone about among you alone without fear and i do not fear now do as you choose and while all the disciples ran away jesus was left alone the officer of the soldiers ordered jesus to be bound and led before annas this annas was a former high priest and lived in the same house with caiaphas who was then high priest caiaphas it was who provided the reason upon which they decided to kill jesus namely that if he were not killed the nation would disappear jesus feeling himself to be in the will of the father was ready for death and did not resist when they took him and was not afraid when they led him away but the very peter who had just promised jesus that he would not renounce him but would die for him this same peter who wished to protect him now when he saw that they were taking jesus for execution and being met with the doorkeeper's question whether he was not with jesus gave up and deserted him it was only afterwards that hearing the cock crow peter brought to mind all that jesus had said then he understood that there are two temptations of the flesh fear and fighting and that it was with these that jesus struggled when he prayed in the garden and asked the disciples to pray and now he peter had fallen before both these temptations of the flesh of which jesus had forewarned him he had wished to fight against evil and to defend the truth he had been about to strike and do evil himself and now he could not endure the fear of bodily suffering and had renounced his teacher jesus had yielded neither to the temptation to fight when the disciples got ready two swords for his defense nor to the temptation to fear before the men of jerusalem first in the case of the heathen and now before the soldiers who had bound him and led him to trial jesus was taken before caiaphas caiaphas began to question him about his teaching but knowing that caiaphas was examining him not to find out what his teaching was but only to convict him jesus did not answer but said i have concealed nothing and now conceal nothing if you wish to know what my teaching is ask those who heard and understood it for saying this the high priest's servant struck jesus in the face and jesus asked him why he so beat him but the man did not answer him and the high priest continued the trial witnesses were brought who deposed that jesus had boasted that he made an end of the jewish religion and the high priest interrogated jesus who seeing they did not examine him to learn anything but only to make a show of a judicial trial answered nothing then a priest asked him tell me are you the christ the son of god jesus said yes i am the christ the son of god and now in torturing me you will see how a son of man is like to god and the priest was glad to hear these words and said to the other judges are not these words enough to condemn him and the judges said that is enough we sentence him to death and when they said that the people threw themselves upon jesus and began to beat him to spit in his face and insult him he was silent the jews had no power to punish men with death and for that needed permission from the roman governor therefore having condemned jesus in their court and having subjected him to ignominy they took him to the roman governor pilate that he might execute him pilate asked why they wished to kill jesus they said because he was a criminal pilate said that if he was so they must judge him by their own law they said we want you to put him to death because he is guilty before the roman caesar he is a rebel he agitates the people he forbids payment of taxes to caesar and calls himself the jewish king pilate summoned jesus before him and said what is the meaning of this are you the jewish king jesus said do you really wish to know what my kingdom means or are you only asking for form's sake 
Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, and it is the same to me whether you are the Jewish king or not. But I ask you, who are you, and why do they call you a king? Jesus said, They say truly that I call myself a king. I am indeed a king, but my kingdom is not of earth, but of heaven. The kings of the earth war and fight and have armies, but as for me, you see they have bound and beaten me, and I did not resist. I am king from heaven. My power is of the spirit. Pilate said, Then it is indeed true that you think yourself a king. Jesus answered, You know this yourself. Everyone who lives by the Spirit is free. I live by this only, and I only teach by shewing men the truth, that they are free by the Spirit. Pilate said, You teach the truth, but nobody knows what the truth is, and everyone has his own truth. And having said this, he turned his back on Jesus and went again to the Jews. Coming out to them, he said, I find nothing criminal in this man. Why then put him to death? The priests answered, He ought to be put to death because he incites the people. Then Pilate began to examine Jesus before the priests, but Jesus, seeing it was only a mock inquiry, answered nothing. Then Pilate said, I alone cannot condemn him. Take him to Herod. At Herod's tribunal, Jesus again answered nothing to the accusations of the priest, and Herod, thinking Jesus to be a common fellow, ordered him, for mockery, to be dressed in red clothes and sent back to Pilate. Pilate pitied Jesus and began to entreat the priest to forgive him, if only on account of the feast. But the priest did not consent, and all the people with them, cried out to crucify Christ. Pilate tried a second time to persuade them to let Jesus go, but priests and people cried out that he must be executed. They said he is guilty of calling himself the Son of God. Pilate again summoned Jesus and asked him what he meant by calling himself the Son of God. Jesus answered nothing. Then Pilate said, Why do you not answer me, seeing that I have the power to execute you or to set you free? Jesus answered, You have no authority over me. Authority only comes from on high. And Pilate a third time began to persuade the Jews to set Jesus free. But they said to him, If you will not execute this man, whom we have exposed as an enemy to Caesar, then you yourself are not a friend, but an enemy to Caesar. And hearing these words, Pilate gave way and ordered the execution of Jesus. They first stripped him and flogged him, then they dressed him again in a ridiculous way, and they beat him, mocked him, and insulted him. Then they caused him to carry the cross and led him to the place of execution where they crucified him. And as Jesus hung on the cross, the whole populace mocked him. But to this mockery, Jesus said, Father, do not call them into account. They do not know what they are doing. And then, as he was now drawing near death, he said, Father, I yield my spirit into thy care. And bowing his head, he breathed his last. The End End of Section 19 End of the Gospel in Brief by Leo Tolstoy